Hey everyone, it's Marla. Welcome back to another video going along with my website in JesusName.net. Hope you go on over there and subscribe for free so you can get all of my videos and the blog posts sent directly to your email inbox. And uh, we are going through the Bible cover to cover and you're with us uh, right smack dab in the middle of a book of the Bible, which uh, we are in the book of 1 Kings. Now, pretty much every week I say, well, it's a great time to be here because it's, a, you know, it's an exciting new thing. Well, today <laughs> it's a great time to be here, but I don't know that it's because it's so exciting. It's a great time to be here because you are in for um, actually one of the worst times in Israel's history uh, is coming in this week's Bible reading in our Bible reading plan. So um, it's a sad day. <laughs> it's a sad day to be here, but... Um, you know, it all turns out good in the end because that's the promise of our King Jesus. And so um, today's video, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what's coming in the next week because it is pretty sad and it is also very confusing because what we're going to see is just a whole slew of kings coming um, because we've lost our last king. We've lost King Solomon, who was King David's son. And um, after King Solomon, things really just go haywire for Israel. And honestly, it is really all because of Solomon. Um, we, we saw that God gave a covenant promise to King David that the the line of David, there, there would always be somebody on the throne from David's line, and um, that would include Solomon. And God promised that the kingdom would, would stay within Solomon's hands for as long as Solomon lived, and, um, and it would continue that way if Solomon continued to follow God in the way that David did. Unfortunately, we have seen over this last week that Solomon did not do that. And because of that, God is about to tear the kingdom away from Solomon and uh, fulfill really what we saw in Deuteronomy 20, 28, which basically God was saying, if you follow me, uh, Israel, you will be blessed in the promised land. And if you do not follow me, then disaster is going to happen to you within the land. And in fact, you will be kicked out of the land, just like the people before Israel were being kicked out for all of their abominable practices. God says that Israel will also be kicked out for doing the same thing if they do not follow. And that is exactly what we see happening. Unfortunately, at the end of Solomon's life, he gets what I'm referring to as a divided heart. He, he does start out loving God and, he, and I believe he still does love God but towards the end of his life he winds up marrying um, 700 wives and then he's got 300 other concubines and and many of them if not all of them are foreigners and because of that King Solomon starts following after these foreign gods or at least building high places to them and allowing the uh the, the worship of these far, foreign gods with which often included unfortunately sacrificing children and um our god <laughs> the only god was not going to allow any king of israel to be allowing um sacrifice of children or any other type of worship to a foreign god happening in the land of israel and because of that god is going to tear the kingdom of Israel away from Solomon's hand. This, um, this, like I said, is a very sad day because everything that we've studied up to this point has has led to this um, promise of Israel being gathered together, God's chosen people, and having a united kingdom in the promised land. And that is what we've seen develop through David's monarchy and now through Solomon's monarchy where Indeed, Israel was, was huge and wealthy and prosperous within the Promised Land. Other nations were at peace with Israel. There was good trade relationships. There was all kinds of good things happening. But because of what we see Solomon do, um, God is going to put that to an end. And, and we see that in the fact that his son, Rehoboam, he's going he's gonna to lead Israel in, in Solomon's stead in, in his, you know, in replace of Solomon after Solomon dies. But there's another person that rises up. His name is Jeroboam. And a prophecy is given to Jeroboam that uh, when the kingdom is torn from 
Solomon and given to his son that 10 of these tribes are going to go to Jeroboam. So we see Israel, after Solomon dies, divided into two. Jeroboam is reigning in the north with 10 tribes and Rehoboam, Solomon's son, is reigning in the south with three tribes. Now, as you read, it's going to get confusing because it's going to say Judah and Israel. That's generally what the split is called, but Judah is really three tribes down there in the south, which is Judah, Reuben, and Benjamin, and then up north is the remaining ten tribes, which are under Jeroboam. Now, what we're going to see is that um, Jeroboam, he just turns everything bad he, he realizes that the people in the north are going to want to travel to the southern area because that's where the temple, Solomon's temple, has been built. And that's where the entire Jewish sacrificial system takes place in the temple. So he realizes that if these people from the north that he's ruling over travel down to Jerusalem to do their sacrifices, it's very likely that they are going to want to stay or be swayed by the southern kingdom. And so what Jeroboam does is he actually sets up a false religious system which which has two hubs up in the northern territory so the people don't have to go down south to Jerusalem to sacrifice. And with this he he has two golden cows and um there's there's a whole other system set up which which is just a false religious system with, with false gods. And so this whole northern kingdom, because of Jeroboam, it's already set on a very, very bad course. And after Jeroboam, we're going to see a line of kings which are, are going to be ruling in the north, and not one of them follows after the one true God. They're all evil. It, it's just not not one good thing comes out of the northern kingdom's kings, all right? Down in the south, we have Rehoboam ruling over the tribe of Judah, which, like I said, is three different tribes. And after Rehoboam, we have kings as well. Some of them are good, not many. Most of them are bad. And so we have the divided kingdom just going downhill into a, a line of bad, generally speaking. And um, there's something that I want to talk to you about today, which is just going to help you in your processing as you get into the New Testament times, which I know many of you are very familiar with. And you might always have wondered what it is about Samaritans that makes them so, um, you know, bad taste in your mouth to the religious people in in the New Testament times. We even see a story with um with Jesus where he's talking to a Samaritan woman and um, that's just like a no-no. Why are you talking to this woman? They were in that time they would actually travel around Samaria because it was such a bad place um, known as such a bad place that they would avoid it completely in their travels. So what is it about Samaritans that is bad? Well it all comes back to this time that I was talking to you about with Jeroboam. So when Jeroboam comes into power in the north, he, he reigns from Shechem. After Jeroboam dies, we have, like I said, a reign of other kings that are all doing evil in the sight of the Lord, all following after other gods. And um, we have two other places that are set up as capitals in the north, their, their center of, of governance. So first there's um, Shechem, like I said, then there's a place called uh, Tizra, and then after that, it's Samaria. So, up there in Samaria, you already know that there's some false god worship happening. Well, what happens down the line, because of all the evil that's happening up north, God finally sends a foreign um, legion from Assyria to come and take over that area completely. They just come and, and invade. And like I said, that's in Deuteronomy 28, that eventually Israel will be completely taken out of the land because of their wickedness. And so the Assyrians come and do that to the northern kingdom in about 722 uh, BC. And when the Assyrians come and do th that, they take a lot of people captive. They take a, a good number of people captive. But there are also some people Israelites that are left in the land. And a lot of Assyria's strategy was to 
um, bring their people into that area and just blend in so that there was no more pure Israelite line going on up there. They would just, you know, intermarry. And so when the Assyrians come to invade and they do this, up there in the north, it just becomes a bunch of people that are half Assyrian and half Jewish. So that that is why we see in the New Testament time that this, the area of Samarit the Samaritans, Samaria, was just no good to the true Jewish people. They just did not want to blend with them because they were thought of as half-breeds. They, they had their own different place of worship. They had their whole other different idea of what it was to worship God. And that was all because of this time with Jeroboam and his not wanting the people to go to Jerusalem. That's how the whole Samaria thing came about. So that's just a little bit of something that I wanted to give to you that might clue you in to what's going on in the New Testament. The other thing that I want to say is, um, you know, as bad as this all is, um, that the northern and southern kingdom, there's a divide within the kingdom. Everything that God did not want to happen, you know, on the uh, from the outset, he wanted this kingdom, you know, united and all of Israel together under one king. God didn't want any of this, but I want to tell you that all of this, like I said from the beginning, Everything is used for God's good. And so that northern kingdom gets attacked by Assyria. They get taken into captivity, the Israelites. Um, the southern kingdom, because they have some good kings along the way, it takes a little bit longer, but the Babylonians come and they take over the southern kingdom of Judah. And they take those people away into captivity. So you have the Israelites spread over all over because of them being taken out of the land and held into captivity. Now that seems awful. But what is uh, amazing to me is that God uses this and he uses this to spread the gospel. And let me tell you how that works, all right? So when we get into the New Testament times, the Israelites, some of them have come back to Jerusalem. They, they, have, they have come back from captivity, you know, years and years before, and they are living in Jerusalem, but they're under Roman rule. But many, many, many of them never did come back. They had been taken into captivity into their areas, Assyria, Babylon, spread out from there. And because they were there for so long, they just integrated in there and they wanted to stay. They didn't go back to Jerusalem. They stayed where they were. But they stayed Jewish. They stayed people that remembered there was one true God. And so we see, after Jesus dies and ascends, his call to everybody is to spread the gospel. And someone we all know as Christians who did this, you know, famously in the very beginning, was the Apostle Paul. As he goes out, we see in the book of Acts, he goes and he wants to spread the gospel out of Jerusalem. And every place he lands, he finds himself a temple where there are Israelites, Jewish people, who are worshiping the one true God. And when he gets there, he goes and he lets them know that the Messiah has come, the Messiah that you've been waiting for, the chosen one out of the line of David has come. His name is Jesus. He's spreading the gospel. And he first goes to those temples where there are people already there who have an idea that there's one true God. So it wasn't such a foreign thing that there's one true God and that there's a Messiah coming, you know, to save Israel. And so that only could have happened because of the captivity, because of the divided kingdom, because of the Israelites being spread all over. The name of that is called the diaspora. It's something you can, you can research. It, it's the, the dispersion of the Israelites because of their disobedience, um, because of Solomon, because of the division, because of their disobedience. They had to be spread all over. But God uses it in the time of the New Testament so that there's these little pockets of people who understand that there is a notion of one true God. They might be a skewed notion, but they're there waiting to receive this from Paul and the other apostles who are spreading out into the world to share about Jesus Christ. And so it's an amazing thing to think about that the worst thing in the world that could have happened for Israel, 
God planned. He knew it. He knew the Israelites were going to be disobedient. He knew Solomon was going to blow it. He knew the kingdom was going to divide. And yet, he's going to use it for the good to spread the word that Jesus has come to the world. All right, so as we go into these books of first, the rest of the books of First Kings, then we go into Second Kings, and then we have the book of Chronicles, you're going to see all this different confusion about all these different kings. And I'm going to just going to encourage you to try to keep it straight in your mind by maybe writing yourself a little chart. Kings of Judah, kings of Israel. And then list who they are underneath so you get who's who. And then um, as we go further into our study, you're going to see the prophets. All the prophets that we're going to study, they came to these kings to try to tell them, turn and go back to God. And so right now we're in the history of what's happening with the kings. But when we get into the prophets, all those prophets, you can just dump right into this section of history that we're in because the prophets were trying to tell these kings turn back to God before these invaders Assyria and Babel and Babylon come and take us away turn 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 and then you have some of the prophets that are speaking at the time that they are in captivity trying to you know get the people back and so um, next blog post, which will be tomorrow, I'm going to post a chart. So those of you who are following the blog, you're going to have your own chart. But um, I would love it if you still write it as you're reading. Write your own so you keep in mind who, who, what king is where and uh, uh, in which kingdom, because it's going to get confusing, and which prophet is to which king. And that'll keep things a little bit more ordered in your mind as it just, you know, it's going to be a whole swirling mess of kings because... They all are, are just not doing, doing very well. A very, very few in the South, you know, maybe 8 out of 20 do okay, but all the rest are just not good. So it's going to be bam, 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 king, 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 lots of kings. <laughs> so anyway, that's all for you to, um, for homework, you know, start writing your chart. And um, I'm going to see you next time. And we're doing it all in Jesus' name. And I hope you'll join me at the website in JesusName.net. See you there.